Boyce, you may continue your examination of the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, as a housekeeping matter, um, uh, I would offer, and this is without objection, um, Plaintiff's Exhibit 1397-1397, which is behind tab 31, and Plaintiff's Exhibit 2856, which is behind tab 81. 81? That's the tab number. Very well. And those exhibits are admitted. <coughs> and um, uh, one other uh, housekeeping matter. Um, Professor Miller, um, you have uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 794A there, which is the index of materials you considered. Um, and uh, I, I just have two, uh, two questions on this. Um, the first question is, uh, went through and you circled those items that you could recall having researched and obtained yourself as opposed to what you were given by counsel, correct? Those are the ones I was certain about, yes. And um, you circled, um, uh, by my count, about 23% of the materials listed here, correct? Um, I haven't done a per percentage. I don't know. But would you agree it was less than a quarter? <laughs> Again, I don't know. It's, it's, I would say it's less than half, and I don't know how much less than half. Now, <clears throat> and there were, there were many that were, maybe I should explain the question marks, if you want explanation on that. Um, go ahead, explain it. Okay, many of these involve um, uh, reports about religious organizations. And I did a lot of my own research on this. I also received some materials from council about religious organizations and their positions on Proposition 8. <coughs> it's difficult for me to sort out um, from this very long list of um, uh, materials which ones I independently found and which ones council provided. but. Um, I think my report used mainly the ones that I had um, independently investigated. And I certainly looked at everything that I'd put in my report um, before I, I put it there. Um, and, and these were the materials that you, in your report, indicated that you had considered and relied on, correct? Yes. Now, I, I do want to follow up what you just said about uh, the question marks uh, that you attach to a number of the documents that relate to religious organizations. Yes. Um, you are aware that uh, Dr. Nathanson put in a report, correct? Yes. You did not see that report prior to preparing your report, correct? That's correct. And you did not talk to Dr. Nathanson or anybody representing him prior to the time you put in your report, correct? That's correct. Well, anyone representing him, I don't know. And anybody other than your counsel? Correct. Right. Um, so that if you received any of the uh, Nathanson materials, you would have received them from counsel, correct? Yes. Um, uh, and uh, I would represent to you that between 140 and 150 of the question marks that you uh, put down are on items that appeared on Dr. Nathanson's list of materials in the report that he submitted prior to the time that you submitted your report? I wouldn't know one way or the other, but... Um, and um, I take it you would agree with me that uh, if these items appeared on Dr. Nathanson's list, you got them from your counsel. It's not just a pure coincidence that the two of you came up with exactly the same list of documents, correct? Um, I, would, I wouldn't know what to say about where the documents came from except that I know that I got the documents, some of them, not all of them, with a question mark from counsel. Um, all right. Um, let me go back um, to the question that I had when, when we broke. And I think I was asking you <clears throat> whether it was your opinion that the opportunity to establish 
gay and lesbian marriage in California was lost in large part because the state's democratic coalition divided along religious lines. Do you have an opinion on that, sir? I'm not asking you what you wrote in one article or another. Right, right. I'm simply asking, as you sit here now, as an expert proffered by the defendants, do you have an opinion on that? Uh, yes, I do. And what is that opinion? Um, I, I believe that that sentence is substantially correct. I would probably want to explain it and put it in context, but I don't uh, uh, disagree with the main um, idea in the, in the sentence. And, and just to be clear, when you're talking about the sentence, you're talking about the statement that the opportunity to establish gay and lesbian marriage in California was lost in large part because the state's democratic coalition divided along religious lines. Correct, sir? Sir? Yes, I'm, I'm okay. I, the, the sentence doesn't say that. It says the opportunity. I, I didn't say the sentence said that. What, I, what I've tried to say is regardless of what you have written, right. okay? Okay. Regardless of what you have written, as you sit here now, do you agree that the opportunity to establish same-sex marriage in California was lost in large part because the state's democratic coalition divided along religious lines? Do you agree with that? I think in large part that's a fair statement, yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and uh, let me ask you to look at page 57. First full paragraph, <clears throat> last five lines. Um, right, the evidence indicates that through the teaching and mobilization of churches or by other means, many of the state's blacks and Latinos viewed the marriage controversy in terms of religion rather than civil rights and thus believed that they could, without contradiction, support civil rights, identify as a Democrat, vote for Barack Obama, and vote for Proposition 8. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And you wrote that, correct? Yes, I did. Now, when you said the evidence indicates, what evidence were you referring to? So this would be um, a couple of things. One is the uh, exit poll data and post-election surveys indicating that a <coughs> substantial um, share of African Americans and Latinos supported Proposition 8. And that um, additional um, information basically based on press reports of um, mobilization in the black and uh, Latino communities in, on behalf of Proposition 8, some but not all of which was based in churches. So that's the evidence um, in, in, in some. Now, as a political scientist, uh, are you aware of any principle that suggests that a religious majority should not be able to use the law to impose their principles on a religious minority? Objection to the form. Objection overruled. <clears throat> A broad statement. Um, I'm um, uh, from time to time throughout history, and you're aware of this, I presume, from your political science um, background. Um, uh, there have been conflicts between a majority religion and minority religion, with the majority religion attempting to impose, through law, restrictions on the minority religion. Correct? There have been times in, in history, world history, where that's been the case, yes. And um, uh, as a matter of political science, is there a generally held view that that is an undesirable way to organize a civil society?
or a majority to impose its religious principles principles on a minority. I think in a general sense that would be an accepted um, principle. But that's undesirable. Um, that would be a, a principle that many um, political scientists would agree with, a general principle, yes. I want to be sure I, I understand what you mean by the general principle. You're saying that the general principle that a religious majority should not be able to use law to impose their views on others is a generally accepted principle of political science. There might be exceptions to that. What? There might be exceptions, but I think that's a general principle. Um, as you sit here now, are you aware of any exceptions to the general principle that it's undesirable for a religious majority to use law to impose its views on a minority? If you, I guess if you look at um, American history, there have been times where a religious coalition built in support of a, a, a project. No, no, I'm not asking about a religious coalition. I'm asking... A, a religious a, majority, okay, and maybe in favor of abolition. Um, and um, uh, the religious majority there, what was the minority on... First of all, the abolitionists weren't a majority, right? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. They were, they were part of the coalition that ended yeah, slavery, yeah. right? We're, Abolition, we're, the abolitions were actually quite a small minority as a matter of history, right? Yes, no, or I don't know. Well, activists, abolitionists, okay. yes. Second, what was the minority who's, uh, that the abolitionists were opposing their view on? Slaveholders. Slaveholders. And um, uh, in, in your view uh, were... Um, slave ho slaveholders, a, uh, a minority uh, that needed protection? No, they, were, they, they may have had views about, which I believe are distorted views, about the religious um, justification for slavery. That would be a religious minority. Um, and just trying to understand um, what you just said, you're saying that Slaveholders may have had a religious basis for their view, and therefore it was inappropriate to impose a different view on them. Your Honor, I'm going to check to this whole line of questioning as well beyond the scope of uh, direct. I didn't get into anything from the 19th century. No, I, I, well, counsel is attempting to inquire about Proposition 8, and he's responding to the witness's comments. Uh, if the witness were to directly respond to the questions, there would not be the need to go into these matters, Mr. Thompson. Your Honor, he asked about world history. It was the first line in this question. Action is overruled. This is cross-examination, Mr. Thompson. R Professor Miller, um, uh, focusing on today and focusing on California and the United States, um, as a professor of political science who is said to be an expert in political science in California and the United States. Do you believe that it is generally accepted that it is not appropriate for a majority religion or a majority religion coalition to impose their views on a minority? Change the... <clears throat> Please answer this question. I think there might be circumstances where political science generally would be um, quite dispos d disposed to agree with a religiously based um, argument on, that might be held by a majority. Um, but again, I think the principle you're driving at is that um, <clears throat> would political science in general believe that it is inappropriate or undesirable for a religious majority to impose um, on a religious minority uh, its views. And um, if it's, I think probably a majority of political scientists would agree with that. Your Honor, I have no more questions. 
Mr. Thompson, redirect. Before you do that, I should ask counsel for the Attorney General if she wishes to inquire of this witness regarding his views on the responsibility of the Attorney General. What's that? Very well. Amar Pachter, P-A-C-H-T-E-R. Good morning, Dr. Miller. Earlier, I believe you testified in response to one of Mr. Boyd's questions that the role of the Attorney General in the title and summary process somehow ameliorated, served to ameliorate the otherwise anti-democratic tendencies of that institution in California. And I was wondering if you could tell me what the basis was for that opinion. The basis for the opinion is we're talking about institutional checks on direct democracy. And one of the stages of the initiative process is that the Attorney General writes a title and summary. So the proponents don't get to write their own title and summary in California. And so to the extent that the Attorney General is able to craft a title of the initiative, then that provides an institutional input into the initiative process. So it's less pure majoritarian than if that stage did not occur. How does it provide that check on the process? Well, again, it's not the proponents writing the title and summary. It's an outside independent elected official who does that. And is it your understanding that the Attorney General can do anything other than provide a neutral title and summary? Well, that was certainly contested in this last, in the Proposition 8 election. What was contested in the Proposition 8 election? The title that Attorney General Brown provided for Proposition 8 was contested by the parties on both sides. Some thought that it was unfairly characterizing the initiative, and others believed it was fairly characterizing the initiative. I understand that. But your understanding of the law in California, Dr. Miller, is it that the Attorney General must provide a neutral title and summary? Or is it your understanding that the Attorney General can provide a title and summary that casts an opinion about the measure that's being submitted to the voters? Okay, here's my understanding. I believe that the law tells the Attorney General to provide a neutral opinion. I believe most students of California politics would say that there is, within the Attorney General's office, some discretion on how to characterize initiatives. And these are often considered very important because voters get to see this title and summary as an important cue to them. And one of the things that opponents or somebody who challenges the Attorney General's title and summary can do is to go to court and argue that the title and summary was not neutral under California law. Isn't that right? That's correct. And the Attorney General do more than provide a neutral title and summary. Do you know? Do I know? Do you know whether the Attorney General can do something in addition to providing a neutral title and summary for the initiative? It's different in different states. I can't recall any instances. We're talking about California. Right. And in California, I'm not aware of any time where the Attorney General has done more. No, that's not the question. Okay, I guess the answer is I don't know. The question is, can the Attorney General do something more than simply providing a neutral title and summary? The Attorney General can publicly oppose the initiative or support it. In terms of institutional challenges, I'm not aware of any. You don't know. Is that it? That's right. You don't know. Thank you. Anything further? No. Very well. Now, redirect, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Your Honor. And 
I have my very last binder of the uh, trial for myself. Anyway, it's very short. Uh, may I approach, please? Well, that's good news. <laughs> Professor Miller, you were asked some questions about materials provided to you by counsel. Um, and my question is, how many of the topics in your report did you personally investigate? Um, <clears throat> all of them. How many of the materials considered in your, uh, listed at the end of your report, the 427 of them, how many did you personally consider? Um, I reviewed most of them. I can't. Um, recall closely analyzing all of them, but I, I believe that I reviewed, um, I tried to review all of them, yes. Okay, and please describe the research methodology that underlay your opinions relating to progressive religious support f uh, for the No on 8 campaign. I'm sorry, can you rephrase? The sure, Pl please describe the research methodology that mm -hmm. underlay your opinions relating to progressive religious support for the No on 8 campaign? Uh, so I did um, extensive uh, reading of uh, progressive uh, religious organizations' websites, um, the Pew uh, Report, which provides a lot of or the Pew website that provides lots of information across um, various denominations. Um, and uh, those were some of the, the important things that I looked at. All right, now I'd like to uh, switch gears. You were asked some questions about a study you had done over a four decade period of ballot initiatives and you had made some comments about California and Colorado and another state and uh, how there was a potential of some of these initiatives to tap into anti-minority sentiment. And my question is, how successful were the California initiatives in the 1970s? that had the potential to tap into a strain of anti-minority sentiment against homosexuals? Uh, the only one I'm aware of that I can recall is Proposition 6. I think that was the only one on the ballot during that decade, and it was defeated by the voters. And how successful were the California initiatives in the 1980s that had the potential to tap into a strain of anti-minority sentiment against gays and lesbians? Those were the three measures dealing with, with HIV, um, AIDS, and the uh, either um, quarantine or reporting of suspected HIV patients, which was, um, I consider, very anti-homosexual, um, uh, uh, gay, and lesbian initiative. And it was all those initiatives were defeated by the voters decisively in California. Right. Now, you were asked some questions about polling, and you were asked questions about whether a majority of the gay and lesbian community supported the re repeal of DOMA. And I'd like to direct your attention to tab D of your binder. And this is a uh, document prepared by Professor Segura and uh, a Ken Sim uh, uh, C-I-M-I-N-O, uh, and it's D-I-X-2649. And I'd like to direct your attention to the last page, um, Table 5, uh, where it says halfway through the table, self-identified uh, LGBT, uh, and it lists in the right-hand column that the support, at least at the time of this document, which was 2005, for uh, same-sex marriage was 73.5 percent. Do you have any basis to dispute that number, the validity of that number? No. Your Honor, we would move the admission of uh, DIX 2649.
This was, I gather, not an exhibit that was used with uh, Professor Segura? It, it was, as a matter of fact, and I forgot to move it into evidence. Uh, and Thank you. 2649 will be admitted. Thank you. Um, now, um, <clears throat> you were also asked some questions about prejudice today in society directed against gays and lesbians. What polling data, if any, are you aware of that analyzes the relative warmness or feelings of the people of California towards gays and lesbians? California, um, specifically. Um, I'm aware of uh, a field poll. This is um, the field organization poll in, I believe it was 2006, where there was um, questions asked sort of similar to the National Election Studies um, uh, feeling thermometer index 0 to 100. And um, the, as, this was in, as I recall, 2006. And uh, from my memory, 65 percent, something like that, close to two-thirds of Californians held either positive or neutral views toward gays and lesbians. All right. Um, now, uh, l let me ask you some questions about religion and prejudice. Do you recall that you were shown uh, documents from the Vatican and the Southern Baptist Convention? Yes. All right. I'd like to direct your attention to tab C of your binder. This is Plaintiff's Exhibit 5. Uh, it's called the Ten Declarations for Protecting Biblical Marriage. Uh, and the first line is, God loves all people, therefore we love all people, and we will do so regardless of how some view or define themselves sexually. Uh, how does this uh, comport with your understanding of the position of evangelical church churches? I think this is very consistent with um, the vast majority of evangelical churches. Your Honor, we would move the admission of Plaintiff's Exhibit 5. Very well. Exhibit 5 is admitted. Um, now, you were also asked about the role that prejudice may have played in the Proposition 8 campaign. And, uh, Your Honor, with the Court's permission, I'd like to play what I believe is a 30-second uh, ad that was run during the campaign. It's DX2308. I'd like to publish it on the screen. Has it been moved in? Uh, no, Your Honor. I'd be happy to play it and then let Mr. Boys, uh, you know, see it and uh, object at that time if he, or however the court would prefer to proceed. Your Honor, I, I did not go into uh, uh, messaging with this witness. I did not want to put the end of the campaign and ask us about that. Well, it is certainly something that was put in in the plaintiff's case in some yes, detail. Well, let's hear it, and then I can determine whether it's beyond the scope. But uh. oh, well, well in, in fact, why, why don't we actually? Um, very well. Let, let's play it. <clears throat> can I help? Is this a video or an audio? Yeah, yeah, yes, Your Honor, it is a video. I think we're experiencing technical difficulty, and um, I, I'm happy to uh, move to a different subject and come back to this unless we can. All right, uh, why don't we do that? Yes, I apologize, Your Honor. Uh, I'll come back to that uh, in just a short moment because I, I don't have very much. But uh, um, now you were asked some questions about laws that were enacted pursuant to the Defense of Marriage Act. Do you recall that? When were the vast majority of those laws passed? Uh, you mean the State D Defense of Marriage Acts? Um, the, the vast majority were um, in the mid-2000s, uh, 2000, 2004, in that period. How do you explain the timing of those laws? So my analysis, as I set forward in my book, is that they're um, largely following the Goodridge decision in Massachusetts. Um, and that was in 2003, as I recall. All right. 
And um, let me ask you, you were shown and, and uh, uh, you discussed at some length your Santa Clara uh, Law Review article that you did uh, before you uh, completed your PhD. Uh, and, and since you completed your PhD and have written your book, uh, Direct uh, D uh, Democracy in the Courts, can you explain the evolution of your thinking on this subject? Beg your pardon? Can, can you explain the evolution of your thinking on the initiative process? Since when? S since the time you wrote the Santa Clara Law Review article in 2001 when you were a graduate student. So in, in 2001, we've, we've had a lot of discussion of articles I wrote a decade ago. Um, again, I um, pursued what I thought was a Madisonian critique of the initiative process and its um, comparative um, institutional disadvantages compared to um, representative uh, government. And those articles are very clear on that um, comparison. Um, and at the time, I thought that uh, the, the best way to think about this problem was to think of the courts as being an important institutional check on pure democracy. Um, so that was my approach to this problem up through about 2001, 2002. Um, I decided to continue pursuing this um, area of research over the, um, after I finished my time as a graduate student. And I took a year-long research leave um, at UC Berkeley. Uh, and this was in the period shortly after the, the Goodridge decision. And my the paper I wrote for the APSA in 2005 um, started to show my, the shift in my, my thinking about this, and it becomes fully developed in my, my book, which was published um, a year ago or less than a year ago. And that is that um, uh, I have a more favorable view of the initiative process after having reviewed the entire 100 plus years of this process, um, dating back to the very beginning of the 20th century. Um, and I've, uh, I see it as a way in which the people can express um, and, and uh, uh, express popular sovereignty in a constitutional system. The other thing that, I, um, that shaped my thinking about this, again going back to the origins of the initiative process, is that many of the arguments, early arguments for direct democracy, um, and, um, especially presented by Theodore Roosevelt um, during that period, was that it could provide a check on um, judicial activism. This was the Lochner era, and a lot of progressives thought that um, <coughs> courts were um, expanding rights beyond what the people wanted, and so that direct democracy could exercise an institutional check on courts in the, in when there's a contestation over the proper scope of rights. And so this becomes the basis for my my book, Direct Democracy in the Courts, which is that there are two competing um, forces in the American um, constitutional system that diverge from what I consider the Madisonian ideal. The Madisonian ideal is that um, popular sovereignty and minority rights are harmonized within the legislative process. My early research showed that, in my view, um, direct democracy could pull decisions out of the legislative process my later um, analysis looked at ways that um, the courts could pull decision-making process away from the people. And so um, the way I now look at the marriage controversy is that um, it's, it's one of these conflicts over the scope of rights and the ability of the people to have an input into the definition of marriage. Um, Ideally, from my perspective, this would happen through legislatures. Um, we have an initiative process in this country that allows um, the people to vote directly, and I don't have a problem with that. I noted that um, we had some discussion yesterday about state domas and where did they come from. Um, Eleven of them came from citizen petition, but the majority of them came from legislatures. So if we're concerned about um, defense of marriage amendments coming, you know, bypassing representative government. That's not the case in the majority of states where they've been adopted. In the United States, you have um, 
a consensus between representative government and direct democracy in establishing this definition of marriage. In my view, and this came out of my analysis of the Goodridge decision and later in Ray marriage cases in California, taking that decision out of the hands of the people in general um, is, a, is an example of the courts um, uh, taking too strong a position on this issue, this fundamental issue of social policy in the country. And so I think of it differently than the courts exercising a check on the majority imposing their will on the min minority. Right. Now, how, if at all, has your thinking about Proposition 22 evolved since the time you wrote your 2001 <laughs> Santa Clara Law Review article? Okay. Again, this was before I had done this, um, this uh, project that I just described um, of comparing uh, direct democracy and judicial review in the form of judicial activism. And so I was still thinking in terms of um, the problem of um, majorities and minorities. And again, I would say that many of these initiatives that we described um, affecting gays and lesbians, I would still put in that category. Proposition 6 would be one of those where the majority was imposing um, you know, anti um, uh, uh, discrimination against school teachers who happen to be gay and lesbian. And I decided after a long time thinking about this that marriage was a different situation um, and that the people should be able to have input on the definition of marriage and that it wasn't necessarily um, invidious discrimination against the minority group. I think it's per you know perfectly um, fine if the, if the consensus builds in the country for um, there to be legal recognition of same-sex marriage, but that's different than having it um, imposed by the court. Finally, with respect to tw Prop 22, at that point, I, I viewed gays and lesbians in California as being what I considered a, a vulnerable minority. And if you look at the context of 22, there was more evidence for that. There was, I think, they, uh, the No on 22 campaign raised or was able to spend maybe four million dollars um, to fight that initiative, compared to 43 million dollars um, in 2008. The um, amount of coalition allies they had in 2000 was very different than they had in 2008. So I may have um, misread the situation in, in 2000 with Prop 22, but I, I definitely have a different view of it um, today. If we leave aside the marriage uh, referendum and initiatives that you've uh, examined, how have uh, the political goals of gays and lesbians fared in the initiative process in the last couple of decades, leaving aside the marriage issue? Okay, there have been um, very few um, initiatives in the, across the United States that um, affect gays and lesbians um, if you set aside the marriage um, uh, initiatives. And um, so it can't be said that the initiative process is stripping away rights. Now, there, there's, you know, there's a few examples. If we go back to the uh, 1990s, Amendment 2 in Colorado would be something that I would, I would look at as, as, as um, you know, an initiative that uh, was very sweeping and broad and eliminated um, you know, the, the opportunity for gays and lesbians across the board to um, uh, achieve uh, rights through the political process or through ballot measures. And um, so that would be something that I would still think would be in the category of, of an initiative that would adversely affect <coughs> gays and lesbians. But aside from that, there are very few that I, I can think of that would be, um, uh, that would fall into that category of um, negatively affecting gays and lesbians. Now, do you recall that uh, Mr. Boyce also showed you an amicus brief that William Eskridge had co-authored in the in re marriage cases? Yes. And do you recall that uh, this relevant sentences he read to you said the proponents of Proposition 8 centrally maintained that state recognition of same-sex marriage would require schools to teach vulnerable children that gay marriage is just as good as traditional marriage? 
Yes, I, I believe I recall that was a sentence in that amicus brief, yes. Yeah, and then the next sentence, do you recall, it said that claim has no basis and its acceptance by some voters probably made the difference between the gay minorities having the same marriage rights as the straight majority and having no marriage rights at all. Do you recall that? Yes. All right, Your Honor, I'd like to now uh, show, publish as a demonstrative PX20, which is already in evidence, um, and it's one of the official ads of the campaign. Very well. <clears throat> Mom, guess what I learned in school today? What, sweetie? I learned how a prince married a prince, and I can marry a princess. Think it can happen? It's already happened. When Massachusetts legalized gay marriage, schools began teaching second graders that boys can marry boys. The courts ruled parents had no right to object. Under California law, public schools instruct kids about marriage. Teaching children about gay marriage will happen here unless we pass Proposition 8. Yes on 8. All right, now, Professor, you were asked questions about anti-gay stereotype. Mm -hmm. Leaving aside anti-gay stereotypes, what uh, political themes were articulated in that ad? It's beyond the scope. Well, Your Honor, he was asked about the messaging. And he was asked whether the messaging... W that question is clearly beyond the scope. Okay. Well, do you think that that ad um, uh, is confined to uh, the proposition that um, schools would teach vulnerable children that gay marriage is just as good as traditional marriage? The very thing that Professor Eskridge said uh, probably made the difference. I'm just reading from the portion of the amicus brief that he was cross-examined about extensively about whether the central maintaining message. Section over rule. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, um, I'm sorry, you're going to have to re restate the question. Okay. So leaving aside, uh, actually, could the court reporter read it back so we don't have another objection? Not the only one who's forgotten the question. Yes, I apologize, Your Honor. <laughs> that happens, Counsel. <laughs> question: well, Do you think that that ad is confined to the proposition that schools would teach vulnerable children that gay marriage is just as good as traditional marriage? The very thing that Professor Estridge has probably made the difference. My answer is no. And, and why is that? Well, uh, there were. Um, I might have to go back and look at it again. Um, yeah, refresh my memory. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Why don't we just um, play it again? Okay, that'd be helpful. Yeah, yeah. We're not going to play this ad a second time. We're, we're almost done, Your Honor. I thought you were on the right track, Mr. Okay, Thompson. Okay, I apologize. Focusing on the Eskridge article since yes. that was placed before the witness yes, during yes. his cross-examination. Okay. So, so if you see yes, that yes. way, okay. that's fine. Okay, given your familiarity with yes. the campaign materials, what were some of the uh, issues other than uh, children being taught in schools uh, that gay marriage is just as good as traditional marriage? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm recalling the ad a little bit, um, and I may. Uh, one of the things is you have a, you have a law professor there talking about uh, the imposition by judges of uh, a decision in this issue that would prevent um, the people from being able to, um, uh, through democratic processes, d determine this issue, and I think there's also a theme in there of tradition. Um, traditional marriage, uh, which is, I think, uh, a different, um, different certainly than in, you know, in, uh, what was suggested by Professor Eskridge. So those are at least two themes. Very well, Your Honor. We have no further questions. You're saying that it is never appropriate for the judiciary to intervene in the initiative process. No, Your Honor. When is it appropriate? In my view, it's appropriate when an initiative, um, or just like any other statute enacted by a legislature, 
violates, in, in this case, the, the federal constitution. Make that determination. <clears throat> That's ultimately a, a question for the, the courts to decide. The, the, the context of um, this is this is the first time we're really getting this aired in the federal courts. There was um, an issue in the state courts as to the interpretation of state constitutions. And should I explain what I mean? Well, the difference or? you made an interesting comment uh, that the initiative process provides a check on a Lochner era judicial activism. And yet you've just said that it is appropriate for the courts to intervene <clears throat> in the initiative process in some circumstances. And what I'm trying to tease out is what are the circumstances in which you think it is appropriate? Where there's a well-grounded constitutional principle that is violated um, by the initiative, and that's <clears throat> that's my that's my view on it. And um, it's it's somewhat that the Eskridge article, or the Eskridge Kane brief, uh, dealt with state constitutional law, which is somewhat different. It's more flexible. There's opportunities for the voters to amend constitutions, and so. That's where you have the interplay between popular majorities and courts, which is somewhat different than the relationship between um, the initiative process and uh, federal constitutional law. So where there is that well-grounded constitutional principle at stake, the initiative process, in your view, should, consistent with political theory, uh, be checked. Same way that state legislatures or Congress should be checked. Very well. Thank you uh, for your testimony, sir. And, uh, Council, we're going to take a break for luncheon. I'm going to hear a motion to suppress while you're having luncheon. And uh, it probably will uh, mean that we won't be back until 1.15 or thereabouts. Is that agreeable? All right. We'll see you then. <coughs> Thank you, Your Honor. You bet. Okay.